USCHO.com. Welcome to USCHO Edge for Friday, November 17th, 2023. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Conley and Dan Rubin. Well, we could have picked a whole bunch more games to go through, but our limit each week is five. So uh, we tried to spread the wealth around the country. And the first one on our list is an interesting one, Penn State at Michigan. Uh, Penn State is plus 154. And Michigan is minus 210. The over-under on this one is seven. Seven. <laughs> seven. And I still like the over. <laughs> I, I had to go back and look and see what the last few times these teams have played. Now, they, they played the regional final against one another last year. It was a 2-1 uh, win for Michigan in overtime. Take that game out, though. That's a very different situ- situation. You're thinking differently in the postseason than you are. The last two games played in Ann Arbor, Five four Michigan seven three Michigan. Uh, there's not that much difference between last year's teams and this year. So the thought that we're thinking that ten ten, I almost said ten runs, ten goals can be scored between these two teams, uh, is not out of the realm that we just showed it. I mean, last year what was the numbers nine and ten for two two nights in Ann Arbor. Um, they were a little bit more modest when they played at Penn State. It was four three and three nothing. Um, but yeah, I I like the over here, um, Dan. Am I crazy to think that this could be eight goals or more? No, no, you're well. I mean, you are crazy, but not not for that reason. I I, I think that that is more than doable. Uh, I already saw this as like a five four game, and that's going to pound the over. So. Uh, I, I am very much into that. I I think every time we talk about Penn state, the overs always in play. I also think if you look at Penn state, the last couple of weeks, the, the offense is starting to, to rack some goals up. They, they haven't racked up wins, but the the goals have been there. And I think that's the, uh, I think that's the thing that to, to watch for. I also think that a desperate Michigan team that hasn't won a game outright in regulation or in overtime for that matter, uh, since, since the Lindenwood series back in at the, before Halloween, uh, equals high flying intense hockey. I think this is going to be sneaky. Very, very good. Uh, I also think that the, the losses that Michigan have taken, there's no shame in the losses that they've had, uh, given the teams that they've lost to. I just think that both teams are going to come out in this one and, and, and pound at each other. And, and that's going to equal a lot of offense. And it's going to be a really fun weekend of hockey, if nothing else. Yeah. A track meet. That's what, you know, most people call it. And I think that that's that style probably favors Michigan just a little bit. Um, the whole thing is, is how the goaltending is in this series. That's the only thing that could keep the numbers down. I think both of these teams will have plenty of great A opportunities. It's just how the goaltending ends is between these two clubs. Well, let's look at the uh, next game on our list then. And this is a big one in the East, a big one for the ECAC. You know, we've been talking about how many teams does ECAC hockey get into the NCAA tournament. Right now, they're a little above 400 out of conference. So it may be two at the most, and it may come down to these two. Cornell, who's at Quinnipiac. Uh, Interesting on this one, the over-under is five and a half. Cornell is plus 135. Quinnipiac is minus 175. But the Bobcats have shown themselves not to be as impermeable as they were last year. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good way to put it, Ed. Um, I, I I kind of you know look at this and say you know Cornell is certainly a team that is is going to give them some fits, um, but it's also a team that I feel like Quinnipiac likes to match up with. It's it's you know. Their offense isn't as as high flying as you, you'd usually expect, um, and you know I think that that's a game that can be more competitive. These games are typically very low scoring, though. I'm just going back and uh, going back a, a few seasons now to even go back to the COVID season because they didn't play the year after uh, a four nothing win for Cornell last year at Lina, a two nothing win for Quinnipiac at in Hamden, a one nothing win for Cornell in Hamden. Uh, before that, you can go back um, a, a 2-1 overtime win for Cornell 
a five, the, the biggest disparity, you have to go all the way back to the 2019-20 season, right before everything got shut down for COVID. Quinnipiac had a 5-1 win, but these, these two teams do not combine for an, a lot of goals. The number of 2-1, one nothing type of games that they've played in the last, you know, decade is, is, you know, very significant. So even at five and a half, I like the under here. Um, but I do like Quinnipiac at home. I think that they, they, uh, they can, they, they're going to be up for this. They just came off that uh, big victory over Yale at home. Um, so I think they should be ready for this one. Yeah. And I, I like, I like Quinnipiac here too, but, but I want to say it under the, under the premise that, I don't think either team has necessarily, I think this is a big game for both teams. I think that's the, that's the right way of putting it. Because if you look at the schedules and the way that they've played, they both have uh, equitable stats, right? Their, their stats are are kind of in the same boat of, of being able to score three and a half goals a game right around the top 15 in the country. In that respect, uh, they both have allowed about the same goals per game. I think they're actually one and two in the country right now and goals allowed, uh, Cornell slightly better at one. I mean, we're dealing with 1.3 to 1.4 uh, <laughs> that rate. So, you know, you're splitting, you're splitting grains of salt. Uh, but I also think that the teams that each team has played dictates a little bit more about this matchup, which is that neither team has really earned a, a marquee win. You can say that Harvard is a marquee win for, for Quinnipiac. Uh, UNH might be a, a marquee win. So might Maine because they've played more games. But when you start looking at the way the league has has broken out, uh, Dartmouth is proving to be better than than a lot of people have thought. So uh, Quinnipiac's uh, draw against them and the same kind of same result for Cornell. Uh, Harvard is not, I think, what that top two, top three caliber team right now uh, in in ECAC the, with the way the numbers are shaking down. And Brown and Yale both just are right now Brown and Yale. So neither one of them played particularly well against Cornell or Quinnipiac. So I think this is a really important game for both of these teams. I like Cornell's odds at plus 135. I just don't necessarily think that it's an inviting game. Like, I don't, I don't think that's going to be a bet that you're going to win, but I think that the odds make it good enough to really consider Cornell um, I, I really like the under here, even if five and a half, it's kind of the, the yeah. anti Penn state Michigan. That's the, that's the one thing I would say is five and a half. These two teams, they, they just play the same style and Cornell's got one, probably one of the best goalies in the country in Ian Shane Quinnipiac's always been good in front of their net. So this is not going to have a lot of goals, but at the same time, this is going to be, I could also see this being one of those three, two, and then you add an empty net and now you hit the over. Well, let's look at one more before we take the break. And this is a big matchup in the Big Ten, number one, Wisconsin. And again, I'm I'm stunned on that one. In fact, uh, you want to see how long it, it's been. It's been since 2006 that both the men and women for Wisconsin have been number one in the country. So that's uh, quite some time. But number one, uh, Wisconsin at Michigan State, um, the over-under on this one is six. Wisconsin's minus 120, Michigan State is minus 110, almost a toss-up. Yeah, you know, and I don't think you can even really look at the history of this series much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking back and, you know, these guys split a series in Madison last year. Uh, Wisconsin got swept by Michigan State in, in Lansing last season. I don't know if they really matter. I feel like both of these teams have changed so much. Um, I think that it, it deservedly this should be a pick 'em, and that's what you know a minus one ten versus a minus one twenty is. Um, you know, I guess they're they're slightly favoring uh, the Badgers on the road, but uh, I don't know where to go with this one because I, I I hate to say it, but I feel like we don't still have enough data at this point. Um, you know, Wisconsin has been fantastic when they need to be. They've had some tough opponents that they've played. They've played them well. Michigan State has had. I had a really good start there. We know they're a pretty good team. They're an improved team. Uh, they're playing at home where they've been really strong. Um, I, this is what I, I think I'd have to stay away from it because I don't have a feel for either one of these teams. If you, if you put a gun to my head and said, pick it, I'd probably go with uh, Wisconsin just because they've been the hot hand. Um, but I, I think that there's a, you know, 
a chance this thing could be a really low scoring series. Um, you know, we said over under was six. I don't, I wouldn't even touch that. You know, when I look at the, the games of, of late, yeah, you had a bunch of eights last year, a six, a five, a five, a seven, like they're all right around there. But again, I don't even feel like these are the same two teams they were last year or two years ago. I hate this game on uh in terms of a, a betting standpoint. I love the game as a game to watch, but I also don't love the fact that Wisconsin is number one because other teams lost uh, right now. When you look at where Wisconsin has won their way in, uh, they had that bye week last week where they were off. They, they were coming off the Michigan series at home. They had their time out uh, time off the ice and the right teams lost, which meant that is voters tend to tend to go. Well, the team that didn't lose winds up getting the majority of the number one votes. I know when I filed the poll and I had Wisconsin number one in the country, I was like, yeah, you know, I don't feel that they're the best team in the country right now. It's just nobody else really deserves the spot, which is not the way I want to vote a team. Number one, it's it's the <laughs> polar. Out. Yeah, that's just not the way I feel about it. Like, hey, you're the you're I, I, I would rather see them at number three, rather see them at number four. But I had them at number one. By the same token, you look at Michigan State and, and Michigan State has has won its way up the pole a bit by beating Ohio State, by beating teams and amassing wins but outside of the big 10 i still look at those two boston college losses on the road and think all right i need to see something more out of michigan state before i would feel comfortable betting them the 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 ohio state wins aside the the penn state uh, win on saturday aside i i just don't feel that those games amount to enough for me to confidently bet michigan state i think a big part of this is michigan state's at home I think that's going to tilt the odds. I think if this were in Wisconsin, Michigan State would 100% be an underdog and probably be sitting around like plus 120 or, or plus 130. Uh, so it, with that kind of in mind, how much do you factor in the home ice advantage? How much do you factor in? I would stay away from this one altogether. I think the, the over under, I would even stay away from just because you don't know what you're getting. I think Wisconsin under Mike Hastings, you're you're going to lean under because that's just, Wisconsin, I think, is going to be one of those teams like we lean over whenever Penn State's on the ice. We lean under whenever Wisconsin's going to be on the ice. That's that's kind of the way I, I kind of look at it. But as, as for the odds, I hate pickums in general. I'd stay away from that one unless you unless you really believe Wisconsin is number one, unless you really believe that Wisconsin shouldn't be number one, in which case then bet your team, you know, responsibly there. Well, let's take a pause. We'll come back and look at a couple of more games. This is USCHO Edge. We're back with USCHO Edge. I'm Ed Trefsker with Jim Connolly and Dan Rubin. How about this one in Hockey East? Number nine, Maine, visiting number eight, Boston University. The Terriers fresh off a home-and-home sweep of UMass Lowell. And uh, the shocking win and tie with a shootout loss over then number one BC at Alfond Arena in Orono last week. And this one has an over under of six. Maine is a plus 154 and Boston University is minus 200. Yeah, you know, this is one of those games. I'm not sure that the line itself is that attractive to me, but the over under being only six. I like this one, you know, last year. Uh, you know, one goaltender, at least Maine's goaltender was the same, um, but you didn't have as much offensive talent uh, on both teams. You have a little bit more in terms of offense. I, I like the over here. These teams played a, a 5-3 game in Orono last year. They played a 9-6 game in Boston. They played a 5-1 game in Boston. Before that, a season before that, it was an 8-1 uh, win for Maine up in Orono, a 5-1 loss. They've been scoring a good number of goals when they play one another. And you've now probably added a little bit of talent on both sides um, offensively. So I feel like this this is a game that we're going to see. This is going to be a 5-3, 6-4 type of game. I really do believe that. Um, at the same time, um, I feel BU is playing really good hockey of, of late. I think Maine is playing fantastic hockey. You know, I mean, they they, um, they let slip a couple of leads Friday, uh, Saturday night against BC. That doesn't bother me. BC is a really good team, and BC found a way to to take an extra hockey's point out of that, and, and you know, not really make it a lost weekend. Um, but both of these teams are playing well. Um, home ice maybe factors in a little bit, but. 
it's hard to tell. This is, this is a tough one to pick in terms of which team I'd go with. I would just really be thinking about the over under and, and I'd be hammering the over. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you on the over under. I think this is I, I think it's a gimme, which which obviously means this is going to be a one nothing game. <laughs> uh, but I I I love it. And, and I think BU doesn't get enough respect right now for what its offense is capable of doing. I think when I look at BU and I look at what the way that I've talked about them this year, I've said, I need to still need to see more out of the defense. Like I still need to see more defensively. The, the, the game on Friday, they, they gave up a power play goal in the last minute to Lowell. Like, like that was the, you know, they were, yes, they were up three, one at that point, but they gave up a goal late and, and probably made the game more interesting than it needed to be. I, I don't like some of the things that I had seen out of the early part of the season for BU when I was mashing the panic button after the UNH game, after the Notre Dame weekend, uh, I was mashing it because I just didn't like the way it looked. So from an over under standpoint, I think this, I think this game can go, I think this whole series can go one of two different ways. I really do think if BU buckles down and plays well on, on defense, then this is going to tease the under a bit. And, and I think maybe we can, we can look at going under six. I really just don't like the matchup until I see something more out of that. But from an offensive standpoint, and this is the thing that makes me really like BU. They can really bundle goals and they have bundled goals. That eight goal game against Notre Dame was not a fluke. The five, they came out, scored five against uh, UMass. They scored four against Notre Dame and uh, against North Dakota. They scored six this past weekend. I, I am realizing now how talented this team is offensively. And to me, that's one of those things that Maine has to match that for us to hit the over. And I think that's one of the things that I'm still skeptical on because Maine, as much as I like Maine, as much as I think that they're a real factor in hockey East right now. And I think this is probably the best league in the country right now. Like this is, it's out of control how good these teams are playing. I don't like, um, I don't like them to be able to come out and score five goals against BU. And then we wind up in a shootout. Like, I just don't think that's, I just don't think that's going to happen on Friday. At least might happen on Saturday. I don't think it's going to happen on Friday. How about the number of shots Maine put up against BC 38 on Friday, 33 on Saturday. They're getting their chances. Um, And I think for BU, it's going to come down to how solid they can be in their defensive zone and how well Matthew Caron can play between the pipes. He was great last weekend against Lowell. And I thought that their defense did a great job blocking shots and kind of clogging up the middle of the ice. Everything was to the perimeter. So I feel like this BU team uh, is getting better on the defensive end. But I also think that this is a very different team they're going to see in Maine than what they just saw in Lowell. Lowell's banged up. Lowell is not a team that builds its game on scoring six goals a game. I'm sure they'd like to, but you know they're a team that wins more two one and one nothing games probably than anybody in the country. So I, I, I look at Maine as having plenty of ability to to pepper this net. It's how well Karan plays. Uh, same thing can be said on the other side for Osmond. You've still got to handle. Uh, you know, guys like Lane Hudson and Macklin Celebrini, who, you know, Celebrini, every time he's touching the ice, he's putting up multi point games, you know, four, four more points on, on Saturday uh, after not playing on Friday, you know, cause he was a little bit banged up. So I, I just, I look at this BC offense, they're a, a juggernaut. I'm sorry, BU offense. They're, they're kind of a, a train right now. Can man stop them? Big question. Will BU get the goaltending and defense? That's the other question. Last game on our schedule is Minnesota Duluth at St. Cloud State. Over under is five and a half. Duluth is plus 145. St. Cloud State minus 190. We talked with Brett Larson earlier this week, Jim, and he talked about his young team that wasn't as bad as it started out and may not be quite as good as the four game winning streak. But if I remember right, uh, Minnesota Duluth a little banged up too. That's that is probably the X factor. And this is the fact that, you know, they're they're looking for a few players back in their lineup and it sounds like some of these injuries are longer term so um if if Duluth can find a way to slow down this St. Cloud State team a little bit on the road not the easiest thing um maybe uh i see this being potentially a pretty high scoring game um I just don't, you know, we we haven't seen a lot from Duluth since they've suffered some of these injuries and St. Cloud State has started to wake up. Um, so 
Could we get a 5-4? Could we get a 6-2? All of those are kind of in there. I don't see one nothing or 2-1 or 3-2 in the equation here. Um, but I, I definitely like St. Cloud at home in this one. One of the things, one of the things that I always like to to look at is what happens in a poll when we we mash teams together because risers and fallers tend to come near each other. I, I always get a kick out of when a team, and this is kind of how even the way I've uh, voted in the past is that you see wind up with two teams next to each other and you say, okay, if this team wins, then we'll, we'll see kind of how they jump into the next phase or jump up and teams are and another team comes down. Uh, I love that St. Cloud re-entered the poll at 19. I think that's uh, an indicator of how they've they've been able to beat up on how they beat up on Western Michigan, how they kind of jumped up. I will say that I think Duluth falling out of the poll with as few votes as they had was a uh, was a tough pill. I don't think I had them in my poll, but it was a tough pill for me to swallow that that I just that apparently enough people agreed with me to drop them to 12 votes. So I think this is one of those other indicators where we know that Duluth's got some problems right now and part of it's health induced, but it's still, it's still a problem. And St. Cloud is playing better. So we've seen one team fall. We've seen one team rise, how that translates on the ice. I think this is, this is just a bad matchup at a bad time for Duluth. I think going to St. Cloud makes it that much trickier over under a five and a half. This is well placed for me. This is this is a cheeky over under because I want to say this is going to go under. Like I want to say that this would be a you know a, a, a three one type of a game, but this is where you're sitting three two, and someone gets an empty netter or someone scores and you wind up at three three. Like this could hit that over very easily. I hate. I, I would stay away from betting this over under. Uh, I also odds wise. Don't love St. Cloud at minus one ninety, even though I think they're going to win. I just think that's, I just think that those aren't great. I think this is a well placed line on this game. Not enough value. I, I get that. If you're trying to bet that one, I would stay away. The one thing I will give you for a stat: uh, the last, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six regular season contests between these two teams. The scores are four, three, four, three, six, three, five, three, four, three, five, two. Now playoffs, you throw it into the playoffs. They they met in the playoffs, of course, last year it was uh three one, five one, three one, a little lower scoring, but I just think playoff hockey is different. So regular season, these two teams uh, teams seem to find the back of the net a lot. So to keep that in mind. I, I don't mind this over under. I actually uh like the over here. I don't mind pushing it there. That's one of the one of the bets I, I really like this weekend. I will say, I will say in terms of the odds, we, we mentioned this uh, last week or, or a couple weeks ago, last time I was on about the, the name value. I think this is one of those games where this is a well-placed line. This does not have name value. I think factored in of St. Cloud holding more name over to Duluth. It's not like the BU game at minus 200, where I feel like BU's reputation and preseason expectation kind of hangs over them to push the odds up against Maine, who is a quote resurgent or, surging type of team into the top 10 where they, where they're ranked eight, nine next to each other. I do think that the line in the over under here is just incredibly well placed. This might be the, well, the, I don't think this is one of those where you're saying, ah, oh, St. Cloud's a heavy favorite because they are, because everyone loves St. Cloud. No, I, I think this is, I think if you look, oh, I think this is probably the perfect line of the week, just well executed on everyone's front, putting the odds makers. The computer did their job. Yeah. Weird. It almost never happens that way. Let me just throw one other thing in. Thinking back to last year, I think we saw a trend of a lot more scoring early on in the season that yeah. settled down as it went on. Yeah, that's that's very true. We, I mean, goals were up in October and November last season. Then by January, you actually saw everything trending back toward the middle. And then by postseason time, take out, you know, maybe those big 10 games in the first round of the tournament where, you know, sometimes you're getting nine, 10, 11 goals, but you know, you did see a lower scoring uh, postseason for the most part um, across the board, you know, again, take out certain regional first round games that just became mismatches. But um, yeah, I, I think that overall you're right that I, I think goal scoring is still trending up for this, uh, this opening couple of months of the season. Well, Jim, we'll have more on these games in this week's USCHO Edge column. 
for Jim Connolly, for Dan Rubin, I'm Ed Trefsker, and we'll catch you next time.